Hello, and welcome to online worship at University Christian Church. My name is Shannon Moore. I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning or whenever you may be watching this service of worship. I hope that you'll take a moment to go online and visit our website. There you can access the worship bulletin. You can submit any prayer requests you may have. You can give your offering. And you can also see the many ministry opportunities that are happening here at University Christian Church. So now let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship. God of healing, we bring you our sorrow and we ask for the bread of joy. God of wonder, we bring you our weariness and we ask for the bread of inspiration. God of transformation, we bring you our despair and we ask for the bread of hope. As a community of faith, we pray for one another. I invite you to find the joys and concerns of our faith community in our digital bulletin at universitychristian.org. There you will also find a place where you can share with us your prayer concerns. Each week as a clergy staff, we gather to pray for you. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. God of forgiveness and new beginnings, you feed our hearts with compassion and nourish our souls with the bread of heaven. As Jesus fed the hungry crowds, knowing that they needed both physical bread and the bread of heaven, fill us with your generous spirit, for we are hungry for something greater than ourselves. Rain down your bread for us. As we seek to care about those who are starving, rain down your bread for them. Lord, there are those of us who are hunger for the comfort you give. Pour your comfort on us. There are those who don't know what your comfort and care look like. Pour your spirit upon them. There are those who need your comfort in the midst of their sorrow. Pour your comfort down on them, God. There are those who are seeking to know you in their lives. Use us as your hands and feet to go and tell the good news. There are those who live in hopelessness and despair. Use us as your hands and feet to bring the good news of the hope you offer. O oh God, help us to remember that we stand continually in need of your healing mercies. Bring us to you with open and repentant hearts for your loving care. As we receive the wondrous gift of the bread of life, may we truly be reminded that Christ nurtures and feeds us with his own life. Fill our hearts with your spirit and make us one with Christ. As we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we are looking at a passage of scripture from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. John's Gospel begins with a beautiful description of Jesus as the promised one sent from God, the Messiah, the one who brings light to a world living in darkness. 
We've seen him gather together his disciples, change water into wine at a wedding, heal the sick. But mainly in John's gospel so far, Jesus has been teaching, teaching about heavenly things, about eternal life, and about God's saving love. Now, because of the things he's been doing and he's been saying, he's gathered quite a following and a crowd of about 5,000 or so follow him across the Sea of Galilee to see what he might do next. And in a move that completely disarms his disciples, Jesus takes it upon himself to feed that crowd of 5,000 people, even though they don't have any food with them. Now, remember, these are people who had no concept of grocery stores or a stocked refrigerator or what a full pantry looked like. Getting and finding food every day was just part of life. But in the crowd, there was a boy, a boy who had five barley loaves and two pieces of dried fish, which he gave to Jesus. And Jesus, by his own hand, distributes that food enough for every person in that crowd of 5,000 to eat their fill with 12 baskets full left over. Eating your fill and having leftovers, that didn't happen. And the folks were so excited, so taken with the idea of the other things that Jesus might be able to do. Maybe he could provide shelter and clothing as well, that they proclaimed that Jesus must be made king, but Jesus didn't want anything to do with that, so he slipped away. That night, the disciples get into their boat to cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and the crowds see that Jesus isn't with them. And while they're out there, a storm comes up. Jesus walks on the water to the boat to see the disciples safely to the other side. But then the next morning, when the crowd gets up, they go to where they had been, where Jesus was. And I imagine they were thinking that Jesus was going to make them something for breakfast. But Jesus isn't there. And they knew that there had only been one boat. And he wasn't on the boat. So what's going on here? The scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 24 through 35. Here begins the reading. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God, the Father, has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so we may see it and believe it? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from which comes down from the heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, thank you for your words of Holy Scripture. Let them enter into our lives and be reflected in the way that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My favorite thing about my kitchen is that right over the sink, there's a window. That just seems right. I like to look outside the window while I'm doing the dishes. Now, I do have a dishwasher, but sometimes I enjoy hand washing my dishes. I like the the productivity of it. I used to have a friend who would say, if you're in a quandary, do the laundry. And this is kind of the same concept. It's this tangible sense of accomplishment. Uh, You start with this awful looking mess, and then you end up with a dish drainer full of clean, sparkling dishes. I did it. 
I like the ritual of washing dishes, of stopping the sink, of getting the water temperature just right, of squeezing the dishwashing liquid into the running stream of water and then swishing your hands around in the water to make the suds. And the harder you agitate the water, the bigger the suds get. Now, I do want to stop for a minute and talk about dishwashing liquid. I do have what some might call a slight obsession <laughs> with dishwashing liquid. I just, I love the beautiful colors of dishwashing liquid and all the variety of fragrances and the shape of the bottles. And based on my preferences, you will always see a bottle of green palm olive sitting on my sink. My mother uses Dawn. If I go to your house, I'll probably try to sneak and see what kind of dishwashing liquid you have on your sink. There's just something nostalgic about it for me, I think. I remember standing at the sink with my grandmother. She used Joy. She'd wash, I'd rinse, and we would sing and we would laugh. And so last year during the pandemic, during the lockdown, um, I got to thinking about those times with my grandmother, and I think because I was feeling vulnerable and a little stressed out, I decided that I was going to order some Joy dishwashing liquid from Amazon. I thought that the smell of it would provide me with some aromatherapy, <laughs> and I envisioned the butter-colored bottle and its beautiful lines and the colorful label and that delicious lemony scent. So when the box arrived, I could not wait to open it. But disappointment soon set in. Y'all, in that box was a short, clear bottle with a neon liquid in it that smelled a little radioactive. It was not the lemon fresh joy that I remembered. So later on that day, I happened to be on eBay and the cursor was blinking in a box that said, search for anything. So I did. And a few days later, this arrived. It's just beautiful. Um, it smells like it should. Just a whiff. And I'm back to a simpler, safer time in my life. And I kind of went down a rabbit hole. I've now got a collection of about a dozen vintage bottles of dishwashing liquid, which I know sounds bizarre. But it was just an escape, a way to remember a simpler, safer time in my life. But isn't that the way it is, though? Seems that every generation has a rosy memory of a bygone time when things were better, easier. Every time period has its own stresses and problems and worries, and there's always a glorified past to look back on. Them was the good old days. Most everybody I know has some way of looking back, singing or music or reading books or reminiscing, granted not buying dishwashing liquid. And so it was in Jesus' day. In that scripture we just heard, the people who were following Jesus were sort of stuck in the past, and you'll see what I mean here in a few minutes. Now, on that morning, when they woke up to know Jesus provided breakfast, they figured that somehow he must have crossed to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So they all jumped in their boats to go find him. And Jesus knew the reason why they were following him. And he called them out on it. He said, you're following me because yesterday you ate your fill of bread. Why are you spending so much of your time working for something that is perishable? You should be working for food that's going to give you eternal life. Now, in response, those folks asked Jesus a reasonable question, I think. They said, well, what is it that God wants us to do? And Jesus' response was, your work is to believe in the one God sent. Your work is to believe in the one God sent. Now, despite the fact that Jesus had performed an incredible miracle just the day before, which they had witnessed and participated in, they had the nerve to ask Jesus to prove what he was saying was true. <laughs> what are you going to give us? What are you going to do for us to believe this? And then they get to reminiscing about times gone by. 
You know, when our ancestors were in the wilderness, they got bread from heaven to eat. Now, you may remember when the Israelites were journeying in the desert for 40 years from slavery in Egypt to the promised land, God provided manna for them, little pieces of flaky bread that rained down onto the grass every morning like the dew. It even melted when the sun grew hot. Every person or family would gather just enough of that bread that they needed for that day. There was enough, but there weren't any leftovers. If they tried to hoard it or save it, it would rot. Them was the good old days when people knew that God was taking care of them. And in that moment, Jesus took them out of the past and redirected their focus to the present. It is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. It's not in the past, it's now. Oh, the people want the bread he's talking about. Give us this bread, they said. I am the bread, Jesus told them. I am the bread of life. It's me. You see, the crowd was looking in the wrong direction. Their focus was what, on what used to be, how God used to act. Their vision was so cloudy that they couldn't even recognize that the miracle Jesus had done when he fed them was the sign, was the proof that they were asking him to provide. They were running themselves ragged all over Galilee, chasing after Jesus to meet their needs, feasting on an abundance of bread and at the same time wishing they had manna. Seeing the abundance that Jesus had to offer right now, yet living in the scarcity of the past. And Jesus is just standing there with his arms wide open saying, that bread you ate yesterday, even that's in the past. You're hungry again now. That was just a taste of what I have to offer. These are the good old days. Come to me, eat the bread of life. You won't be hungry again. You won't be thirsty. Your work is to believe in me. Our work is to believe in the one God sent. What does that mean? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? What is the work of believing? Now, once we cut through all the things that we think we're supposed to say and get to the heart of the matter, we've got to ask ourselves some hard questions. Do we hold as true that Jesus is the Son of God? Do we hold as true that following Jesus means putting God first before our family, before our job, before our political affiliation, before our very selves? Our work is to believe in the one God sent. Does our belief in Jesus, in His teachings of love and compassion, in His care for the poor and the outcast, in His insistence that we be generous with our money and faithful in our praying, does that belief affect how we live our lives? Our work is to believe in the one God sent. To believe in the one who taught us to ask for forgiveness in the same way we offer forgiveness to others to believe in the one who defeated death, rose from the grave, and promised one day to take us to himself, to believe in the Jesus who comforts us in the storm, who provides salvation from what would destroy us and gives a feast of a welcome table where nobody goes without and a well that never runs dry. If we believe in Jesus, then we must believe that following him makes a difference, makes us better people makes us better partners and spouses, better parents, better children, better neighbors, and it makes the world a better place. If we believe in Jesus, that He is the bread of life, then shouldn't our lives look like we believe in Jesus? 
Shouldn't we be working to humble ourselves, to pray for our enemies, to not be anxious, to love one another? It seems like there's a collective sense of exhaustion these days. The committee hearing on the January 6th Capitol attack has ramped up the political divide that gets wider every day. COVID numbers are on the rise and fingers are pointing in every direction. And people are hurting. There is a Jesus-shaped pain that cannot be filled with anger and resentment. There is a Jesus-sized emptiness that cannot be filled with stuff or by a politician or with food or money or sex or alcohol or anything else except the bread of life, the true bread of God which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Who is going to live out what it looks like to eat the bread of life? Who is going to step out of the past and into the abundant presence of now? Who is going to do the hard work of believing in Jesus and living not in darkness, but in the light of His love. If not us, church, if not us, who will? I will sing you songs of gladness
As a community of faith, we share the peace of Christ with one another. I invite you to reach out to those in your home, to send a text, send an email, pick up the phone and call someone and share the peace of Christ with them. The peace of the Lord be with you. One of the things that I love about how God works in the world is that seeds are planted and nurtured and the spirit is continually at work in ways that we don't understand. And then the, the connections that we make with one another when we're living in community, um, that's how we find out about different needs and how we can meet those needs. And that's oftentimes how we find out about different ministry opportunities and partnerships. And so I'd like to introduce you today to um, a friend from Bright, who I haven't seen in many years, who's gonna talk to us about uh, Project 44, which is an amazing ministry. And so I'd like to introduce you to Margaret Fields, the one of the founders of Project 44. So yes. Margaret, can you tell us a little bit about Project 44 and what you do and yes. how so, we can join you in the work? Absolutely. So. Project 44 is a local nonprofit organization. We are a 501c3 organization. Um, and it was founded out of this desire to be the church, like not just go to church, but to do the things that we've read about in the Bible, specifically in the book of Acts. Uh, so when we, we were looking for ways to, to be in action, um, we looked to the book of Acts and then we we're trying to think of names for our organization, like acts of love, acts of kindness, which were all taken. Right. So <laughs> we counted up and Acts is the 44th book of the Bible. Uh, so that's where we got our name from project okay, 44. Very cool. And it's based on the, on Acts 2, 42 through 47. Um, and initially we focused on the scripture on the verses that talk about, they shared everything that they had among them so that no one had a need. So we are a car ministry. We take donated vehicles, we make necessary repairs to them, provide um, insurance, pay for title transfer, registration, all those things, and then gift them to people in need. So it's this idea that you have a car that you're not using anymore, or maybe you don't wanna fix anymore. Um, you would give it to Project 44. My husband's a mechanic, so he can make the repairs. Um, and then we gift them to people who are really just trying to do life, but it's very difficult without reliable transportation. So we gave our first car away in 2008, and to date we've given away about 600 cars uh, to individuals and families. Yes. 600 cars? 600 cars. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Yes, That's and incredible. it's all from donations from, from individuals. We're not corporately sponsored, um, but it's this idea that, you know, finding like-minded, like-hearted people who understand how God works in in and through each one of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are moved to give a car and then we just move that over to somebody that has a need. And I love, you know, the focus on the book of Acts because, you know, the community coming together and just yes. to share what they can and take care of one another. It, it didn't, it said the community, not just the disciples or the Methodists or the Episcopalians right. or the Catholics, exactly. but all of us working together Absolutely. and sharing what we what we can. Absolutely, because the church was not a building. It wasn't the pews and the color of carpet and the stained glass. The church is the people, you know, and that's what, you know, we learn about in the book of Acts. And that's what we're trying to continue today, that we we are the church wherever we go. And we do life together because God created us to be in community with one another. I love that. Yes, I love that. Yes. Well, if you want to learn more about Project 44, or if you have a vehicle um, that you would like to donate or a relative or a friend or neighbor has um, a vehicle that you can gift to this ministry, the website is list listed below. And I hope that you will join us in this work um, and join God in the ways the spirit is constantly calling us to work together to meet yes. the needs of our community. Yes, amen, thank you. <laughs> Have you ever eaten a meal that did not leave you satisfied? 
I feel that way often after I've eaten what we call fast food, and it has nothing to do with the amount of food I've consumed. Every week, we have the opportunity at this table to partake in a meal that satisfies. Amazing, isn't it, how a tiny cracker and thimble full of juice sustains us when we participate together in the meal Jesus first shared with his disciples. He invited them, and now us, to eat, drink, and remember. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so we remember the night on which Jesus was betrayed, how he took the bread, how he blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And after dinner, he took the cup and said to them, this is the new covenant my blood poured out for you. As often as you drink it, remember me. Let us pray. Dear God, Today we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to remember the extraordinary sacrifice you made in sending Jesus, your beloved Son, to be with us. Lord, we come to you now to ask for forgiveness for any thoughts, words, or deeds that have not honored your name. We invite you to inhabit our hearts now as we take communion. As we share this meal, come bind us together as one family filled with your love. Lord, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. Lord, as we drink this wine, we remember that you are the giver of life. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that is at work in our lives. Amen. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. As we prepare to go out into the world, let us live into our call to believe in the one that God has sent. 
May God bless and keep you. And may everyone know we belong to Christ by the way we love each other. Amen. Thank you.